Hey folks, Todd Colburn here with your Aerospace Structure Series. This video is on equilibrium of rigid bodies. So far we've seen that with particles, we're pretending that all of the area occurs at one point, the entire structure. Therefore, we can treat it as just a summation of forces acting on that point and they have to sum to zero. When we have uh, rigid bodies, then we have to pay attention to not only the forces, but where they're located, because those forces will cause moments based on where those forces are applied. So now we have summation of forces and summation of moments. This video is on the equilibrium of rigid bodies in two dimensions. So we're going to focus on how to analyze those kinds of structures in 2D. Here's how it works. So once again, we're dealing with statics, which means we're going to assume that nothing uh, moves as a function due to these forces. The summation of forces is zero. The summation of moments is zero. That body does not translate nor rotate. Even if the body does translate or rotate, we can sometimes simplify into this special case. And it's going to make things simpler. Because of this, we know the sum of the forces is zero and the sum of the moments is zero. If they're ever non-zero, then we can have for, uh, sum of forces equals mass times acceleration. Then we're in dynamics class. And the summation of moments is I alpha. We're once again in dynamics class. And we're here we're dealing with applications of statics. Okay, and our moment can be written. We know it's a force times a distance. That distance is perpendicular. But in a more general sense, we can say that some of the moments is the R cross alpha. So if you have a point, you have a force acting out here somewhere. You write the vector, the force as a vector. You write the position of any point along the line of action of that force as a vector r. And you take the cross product of the r crossed with the f, and that will give you what that moment, what that uh, moment is. That moment is i alpha. If it's non-zero, you get it. An angular acceleration, we'll deal with that in dynamics. And if that summation, that cross product comes out to zero, as it always will for this class, statics, then we have a static problem we can sum and, uh, deal with. So once again, we're going to use the free body diagram now. Before, when we were dealing with particles, we draw a free body diagram of a point or particle. Now we're going to draw a free body diagram of the entire structure. We need to identify where everything is, what forces are, where they're applied, and how they interrelate in our diagram. So let's just look at this simple problem from Biron Johnson's text. Here we have a crane. And if we look at this, there's a lot going on that sometimes students will struggle with. But we're going to have to, as engineers, start developing the judgment to quickly break this down into the pieces of information that are relevant. We see a structure here. We're in statics and not strength class. So all we're dealing with is what are the external forces and what internal forces do they cause? If we look at this, we see the mass of this weight that's hanging down. So we can just... Uh, imagine we can just look at this and say, well, the critical pieces of information that we're going to need here is this mass is going to cause a force, and the force is going to be m times the weight. So if we put our little force vector there, that's where that mass acts. And now we can look and say, well, you know, to solve this, I've got these constraints. So we're going to cut the constraints off there and there. And when we do that, we're going to get reactions. Now, this one is a pin joint, which means it can have two reactions. It can have R in the Y direction 
and it can have, and I will just draw it to the right, R at A in the X direction. At this other point, that's on a roller, which means it can actually move up and down due to that rolling action, but it can't move outward. So all we can get is a reaction like this. Now, I didn't try to dry, draw these in the correct direction. I just drew them in the positive direction using a right-hand rule, as if this is to the positive and this is positive. So what happens is now we can redraw our structure. We have all of this. We have this reaction, this reaction, this reaction, and through this wire, that force W. If we put in our dimensions here, what this dimension is, we're going to need that. And what this dimension is, we're going to need that, which is, uh, what, 6. Oh, we've got another piece of information. If uh, So in this case, it looks like we don't know what the weight of the crane is. If we did, we would have another force acting here. But in this case, although they show the CG of the crane, they don't give a weight for that. They're only showing us the weight of this thing over here, which means the crane weight is negligible for this particular case. So we don't have that force. So this is 6 meters. This is 1.5 meters. We now have everything we need to sum our forces in moments. We'll generally pick a point. If we went and summed our moments about point A, we already know what the weight is. We're going to be able to get this RBX directly. If we had summed our moments about point B, we would have had, uh, actually, we still would have got RAX directly since the line of action of RAY is going through that same point. Once we know what RBX is, we can sum our forces in the uh, X direction. Those have to be zero. And that means we're going to have RAX plus RBX plus zero equals zero. And we'll find out that those two reactions are equal and opposite. We can then sum our forces in the vertical direction. And that has to be zero. And we'll fall out, find out that RAY uh, minus W equals zero, which means RAY is going to be equal to, to, our, to that, uh, that weight. This is how we are going to proceed, and we're going to go ahead and do it here now. Uh, we're going to, as we said, we're going to select what body we're going to analyze. What we do is we detach it from the supports. For every support we detach it from, we have to replace that with the forces that can translate. So if we detach it, so we look at how many points, what points... Can we cut? No, we can actually cut it anywhere. Remember the number? Uh, we can actually make a cross-sectional cut anywhere, and wherever we cut it, we can replace that, what we've cut, with the forces it can uh, transfer. If we cut this off at the pin, we know a pin can have one reaction in an unknown direction. Often we think of it as two, re two reactions in rectangular coordinates an X component and a Y component, which is the same thing as only having a force of unknown direction. That would be an R and a theta. Our X and our Y is sometimes easier for us to do. So we're, when we cut off this constraint here, that's going to give us these two forces, AX and AY. Instead of RAX, our text is calling it AX and AY. If we cut it off here, this roller... This roller is just like this kind of roller. It means it can move in the vertical direction. It just can't move out of plane. So we're replacing that with this force B. Well, it looks like in this problem, they do give us the weight of the crane itself. And that force will go here at the CG. And we have a force here out of the crane. We now have everything we need to solve this problem. Proper free body diagram has resketched the, the structure in roughly the right proportions. It has dimensioned that structure. It involves removing any constraints like these two pins and replacing them with any forces that they can transfer. Once again, a pin can transfer two unless it's a roller, which will reduce it to one degree of freedom, one force that can be transferred. 
fixed wall can transfer both two forces and a moment. So that's how we do it. Once we have those, we have our structure redrawn. We also have all forces applied to it, which includes the forces of those reactions or any parts of the structure that we cut off. And we have dimensioned that free body diagram. So we have all the dimensions that we need in order to solve it. We then can solve this by summing our moments and forces. It's actually forces and moments, but a lot of times summing the moments makes it easier to get results back than if we sum our forces first. Got that? All right, so let's see how this works. We'll continue on down. Uh, we pretty much said all this. All right. We already said this. Anywhere we cut the structure, we need to replace it with the forces that can transfer. Okay? And we already looked at that in detail. All right. So let's take a look at reactions at what forces come from certain kinds of things. If we have a roller, it can look like this, this kind of roller, or this kind of roller, or a rocker. All of these will not transfer that kind of degree of freedom. It's going to allow it to move in that direction. Therefore, what we can do, all of these if we find these, that's going to be transmitting a force. We will replace that with a force that's perpendicular to the surface that it's either rolling or sliding upon. That's how it looks. Anytime we have a cable, we know that the force is going to be tensile acting along the cable. And so we can cut the cable and replace it with this force along the line of action of the cable. If we get a link that has two pinned ends, if it only has two pins at the end with no intermediate forces, then the only force I can take is along the line of action of the link. Just like with, the, uh, with that cable. Let me erase the ink on the slide. So what that means is if we cut that puppy right here, we will have a force along the line of action of the link. Now, in this case, that force can be either tensile or compressive. A cable can only translate tension, which makes it even simpler for us. A rod with two pinned ends and no intermediate forces between the pins can translate one force, but it can either be tensile or compressive. What we will do is assume a direction for that force and proceed. If that force ends up being negative, that means it's in the other direction. If we end up assuming tension for a cable and find out it's negative, then something is wrong because cables cannot transmit compression forces. These kind of problems, rollers sometimes, uh, and, and uh, sliding rods sometimes confuse students, but all this means is if you have a rod and you have a member that's attached to a sleeve, then that sleeve can slide upon the rod. Or if you have a rod and you have a slot and this thing is pinned to the slot, then it can slide along the slot. What that means is it's like removing that degree of freedom. This can translate a force like this or like this. And once again, it can be in either direction. It can be in this direction or the opposite direction. Pick one, draw it that way, and analyze appropriately. In this case, we're choosing that. It's going to be 90 degrees from whatever is constraining it. Okay, Those are the different kinds of constraints that we might see. And uh, Now, if we get uh, this, once again, is a pin, same story, and a, uh, a rough surface, sometimes we'll have the same kind of thing. That would have to be a very rough surface, that's uh, got a lot of strength in order to provide the same constraint as a, as a frictionless pin. This here, if we have a fixed support, we can translate. We have a single force of unknown direction, which means all, uh, 
magnitude and a theta, and we have a moment. A lot of times, instead of this reaction of unknown direction, it'll be simpler for us to assume that we have that this force has two components, a vertical and a horizontal force. That's usually the easiest way to solve this. Every now and then we'll run into a problem where if we assume that single line of action force, it will be easier. But usually turning that into two rectangular components will be easiest. And so this can translate. It keeps us from moving this direction. That's why we have that force. It keeps us from moving up and down. That's why we have that force. It also keeps it from rotating, and that's why we have a moment. Once again, you can assume these in any direction, and if our results come out positive, it means it's in the direction we assumed. If our results come out negative, it means it's in the other direction. Okay? This is a very important information for you to master, because if you draw your reactions wrong, all your other work will come crumbling down. It's like building your house on the sand. You need to have the right forces replacing your constraints or all your work is going to be wasted. All right, let's take a look. That's all the principles we're going to learn. We're just going to see how that plays out. We have a structure like this, and we're going to look at some different ways of analyzing this. I recommend you stop the video now and you break this off in the places that make sense to you and replace them with the forces that they can transfer and sketch your own free body diagram, which means the structure and the forces and the dimensions. Got it? If you got that, stop the video and come back after you have solved this yourself. Actually, all you got to do is draw the free body diagram at this point. You don't need to solve it. When you're done with that, you can restart the video. Okay, now that we're back, we will check out which free body diagram is best for this problem. We've got four choices. A, is that correct? B, is that correct? C, is that correct? D, is that correct? Compare these diagrams to yours and see which of these match yours, which do you believe is most accurate and will give you a solution. Soon as you're done choosing and marking it down somewhere, Come back to us. Okay, you done with that? Let's take a look at what it actually is. So the book says that B is most correct, but C is also correct. Why? Well, let's look at this first one. If we look at A, we see that, okay, we took this and it looks like we cut it off here. And we cut the wire here. So we replaced the bottom one with these forces, and we replaced the wire with these forces. However, this wire also, with that cut, it provides forces on this point, and that is not reflected. Therefore, this is wrong. This next one broke it down here. We have the forces, and we cut it off. Instead of cutting it off over here at point B like we did before. Instead of this point, they cut it right there. And now what that means is all of this is our structure now, including all of the cable. So that eliminates having to deal with the forces at point D. And when we cut that thing here, that just gives us one unknown force here. And that is best way to solve this. If we move to point to C, we see that cutting it at E gives us these forces. And what they did was cut the wire here, here, and here. You're giving us forces at B, forces at D. Got that? So that's also correct. But now we have more work because now we have one, two, three, four, five, six 
forces to deal with, unknown forces, potentially unknown forces, rather than only uh, one, two, three. Uh, we, this is one, two, three, four, five, six, instead of one, two, three, four. Now, if we look at, so this is okay. This is best. And this one, if we look at this, we see, okay, we cut it off at E and got these forces, but we never cut the wire. That's incorrect. There's going to be things going on between this structure, this floor, and this wire that are not accounted for. Therefore, this is wrong. So that's how you would evaluate whether it's acceptable, and your responses should match the same kind of thing. Okay? If you didn't get that, try it again, try it again, try it again, and come back until you understand this principle. Okay? Now, if we have a rigid body in two dimensions, let's say we have a bunch of forces like these, we can see, um, first what we would do is we would take all of these forces and we would replace them like we take P and we'd replace it with its X and Y and component. Q, replace it with its X and Y component. S, replace it with its X and Y component. We may or may not have a weight of the structure, which would go at the centroid of the structure. A joint A, when we cut that off, we get two forces. A joint B, when we cut that off, we get one force. And now we have a free body diagram. The only thing we're missing is what? Dimensions. This should have dimensions so we can solve this appropriately. Okay. We now can sum our forces and moments and get our external reactions. Got that? Okay. All right, here's our crane example again. We see here now that we did have the mass of the crane itself. That's going to go at point G. And we have the crate mass, which is going to go at where the crate is. Now, it's really easy to just run forward and stick those masses in our calculation. But in statics, we're not going to be using masses. What we need are forces and moments. So in this case, we're going to need to turn that mass into a weight, a force, which is a weight, which is just that force times the acceleration of gravity. Since this is a metric problem, we would use 9.81 meters per second squared. Multiply our masses by that to get the forces that are applied and apply the forces. Those weight forces will have to be acting toward the ground, which we're going to imagine is downward. So both these forces will act downward at points G for the crane and at the crate centroid. Okay? All right. We're going to draw our free body diagram. We saw before that this is how we would draw it. And then we're going to use that free body diagram to analyze it. We sum our moments. Now, one thing that is often uh, sloppy in some of these slides that I'm using is uh, this does not tell us the positive direction. So what we want to get in the habit of doing is carefully defining what is our positive. In this particular case, we're summing our moments about A, and what the text is indicating is that this, it's calling this a positive moment. So what we want to do is say this is a positive moment. We want to say whether our positive moment is going this way or that way. We want to draw the little moment symbol and a little plus sign. Then we draw our summation sign. We're summing our moments about point A. So we've got the positive defined. We've got the summation shown. We've got the moments is what we're summing. And we've got where we're summing moments. They have to equal to zero. That's what we should write first. Then we write the equation. Since we're working off summing moments about this point A, and we're assuming this is positive, we see that B times 1.5 is going to give us a moment in our assumed positive direction. 9.81 times the distance to it, 2, is going to give us a moment like this, which is opposite to our assumed direction, and that's why we have a negative sign. That force of the crate is also acting opposite to our assumed direction, and that's going to be a negative sign. When we solve this, both of these will move over to the other side of the, the equal sign. We'll divide by 1.5, and we find out B is 
parameters. Now, what we want to make sure we do is follow good practice when we're doing this. So a couple comments. When we show this force, we should identify the force. In this case, we called the force B. I would have called it R sub B sub X, probably. But in this case, we call the vector B. So we can say B equals. It's in the assumed positive direction. But actually, what's better is to show. First, we want to show the force, 107.1. We want to use proper sig figs. Now, remember, in the text, it says... Any number that starts with a non-1 is going to use three significant figures. And any number that starts with a 1 will use four significant figures. So we should be showing four significant figures since our number starts with a 1. It's 107.1 kilonewtons. And what's better than showing it as positive is to say it's in this direction. That is really clear. You wouldn't have this line out through it, my... Wacom pen always does that, and I don't know why it bleeds like that. I must have some setting incorrect. Let's do this again. So we should have shown B equals 107.1 kilonewtons acting this way. Now the reason the way it's shown here is not necessarily incorrect is because we already showed the direction of B this is in the same direction as assumed, and therefore it's shown as positive. If I ask you what is the magnitude of B, what is B, and I showed you B goes this way, then this answer would be correct. But if you chose your own direction for B, then this is not sufficient. This is better because this shows me clearly exactly what direction that force B is acting in. And the same is true for other classes and professors, even though some may not stress that. Once we have that one, we've used our sum of moments. We could actually sum moments again, but for often what we'll do is sum forces. If we sum forces in the x direction, we're going to find out AX, which is acting in the sum. Oh, once again, we should show... What is our assumed positive direction? Which means we should have said, we're talking about forces in this direction. We're going to assume our positive. We're going to sum them up, the forces in the x direction. We actually, this x is kind of redundant because we already show that direction vector. They equal to zero. Then we write the equation, this force, which is in our assumed positive direction, plus this force, which is also in our assumed direction positive direction, plus all other forces, and there are none other acting in that direction, has to be equal to zero. And you find out that A is equal to, a better way to write that would be A, X equals 107.1 kilonewtons. Don't forget to write your units, or it's partially wrong, in that direction. Because it came out to be negative here, we know it's in the opposite of this direction, and the best way to show it would be like I showed you here, and then box your answer. Got that? All right. Now that we've got that part, we can uh, we have solved this problem. Oh, we have our ay, so we need to sum our forces in the y direction. Once again, we're going to say let's call, call acting upwards positive. We're going to show that. Then we show that we're summing our forces. And this is now redundant. It's the y direction, but we don't need to show that since we showed the direction. They equal to zero. Ay minus this force minus this force equals zero. And we solve for this. The way we'd write that, Ay equals 33.3 kilonewtons upwards. The reason it is... Uh, So positive, it's in the same direction as we assumed, and we find it acts upward. That's the way we'd show it. So we'd have three boxed answers for this particular problem to show our solution correctly. Got it? All right. So we can actually, if we take a different point, like if we summed the moments about point B, 
in some all forces and moments, we should find that the summation of moments is zero. In fact, if we sum our moments about any other point on this page, we should always find that the sum of moments is zero or else something's wrong. Okay? All right, here's another problem. We saw this one before too. And now we want to determine our reaction at E. In order to do this, we're going to have to draw a free body diagram like we did before. And then sum our moments and sum our forces. Okay? That's going to be our basic approach. So, this was the free body diagram that we decided was best. And now the easiest thing is to sum our moments about point E. If you sum your moments about point E, we're going to have these four 20 kilonewton forces, all of which are going to be acting like this, times our relative distances. So one of them is times 1.8. One of them is times, what's that, 3.6. The next one's 5 point something, right, and so on. And uh, we also are going to have this other force of the cable acting in the other direction. And what we can do is use the perpendicular distance to that force or write that force as two components. So if we wanted to evaluate which of these summations are correct, E in the X, that's positive, plus 4.5. Now this 4.5 over 7.5, 7 7.5, remember, cosine and sine. If we know uh, if this cable is 4.5 by 6, then a lot of times what we'll do, what you can do to make this easier to solve, or in some ways, right, we can say, well, okay, this is going up 6, and this is going over 4.5. So if we take the square root of this squared plus this squared, we can calculate this, and it looks like that's about 7.5, this dimension here. Now, whenever we need cosine of theta of the angle or sine of the theta of that angle, we can say, well, cosine of this angle is going to be, so let's say uh, this is the angle we're talking about. The cosine of that angle will be 4.5 over 6, over, uh, excuse me, 7.5. The sine of that angle is 6 over 7.5. Some folks use this as a shortcut, so anywhere they would, would have written cosine theta, like r cosine theta, they just write this factor, or excuse me, this factor. Anytime they see that r sine theta, they would use this factor for the sine theta. So what this first one says is, hey, if I take EX, that's this guy, plus cosine of this angle theta times 150, so this force times the cosine of that angle will give us the horizontal component. And actually, it's not this angle, it's this angle here. So by using that cosine, because this angle here, we'll call that theta 1, is equal to theta 2, the angle that I drew there. It's just going downward here. So now if we take this force times the cosine of this angle, we're going to get this component. This is just the cosine of that angle, right? So this force plus this cosine of that angle equals 0. Or this next one says this force plus cosine of the angle equals zero. This is now using the cosine instead of that factor. This says EX plus the sine of that angle, and so on. Oh, I guess maybe we should check what that angle is. I was assuming that was this angle, but let's see here. 4.5 over 6 inverse tangent. Yeah, actually, this is the angle here. This is the angle here. So what we just said was incorrect. Actually, so this is the angle they're dealing with. Let me redo this. Hold on. Great. All right. If we look at this, we see, okay, uh, if we use, it looks like they're using this angle here. So this angle here is equal to this angle here. How do we know that? We have two vertical lines, and this line penetrates both, which means this angle will be the same as that angle, which is the same as this angle, which is the same as this angle. That is the theta that they're using. Since we're using that theta, 
What that means is, if we take this R, if this is the theta we're talking about, for the horizontal component, we're going to need this piece. So we're going to need R, which is 150, times sine of that theta, which is, that sine of theta is now going to be the 4.5 over 7.5, right? So 150 times that, that's what we're actually going to need to get this component. So that means we can use the, uh, the sign of that. We're going to have this force and that component is going to be in this direction. It's going to have two components, this one and this one. And this one is that got the sign of that angle and this one has that cosine. So EX plus this guy is uh, equal to zero. That's okay because that 4.5 over 7.5 is fine. This looks like this is correct. EX plus cosine of that. Well, cosine of this angle will give us a vertical component. So this is incorrect. This one here is EX plus sine of this angle. This is okay. EX plus 6, that's actually going to be this other component again. So that's not going to work. EX minus sine of that angle. That's minus sine of that angle. That assumes that this force is going in the other direction. This is incorrect. So it looks like when you use either of these two to solve this problem. And that's what our book thinks as well. Now, regardless, we're not going to be sorting around trying to figure it out. What we will be doing is saying, okay, we're just going to write our equation. We're going to say the summation of forces in the x direction, the positive equals zero. We're going to say, okay, EX is acting in our positive direction. And we're going to have plus 150 times. And what we're going to need is the sine or cosine. What we need is that horizontal component. What I would have done is use this angle because that's more intuitive to me, and I would have done the cosine of that angle theta equals zero. What is that angle theta? Well, it's just the arctangent of the opposite, which is 6, over the adjacent, which is 4.5. And you can solve it that way. Any of these ways would work to solve that puppy. Got it? All right. And this is what we were talking about before. All right. Now, uh, now that we've done that, we can sum our force in the vertical direction. That gives us a chance to look at which one, which of these equations are correct. Why don't you try to do this and stop the video, try and figure out which ones are correct. There might be more than one. Once you've marked your answer, come back. Got it? Okay, you're done. Here's what it is. Either of those will give us the correct answer. Review your answer and this answer and make sure you understand why. Okay. Let's see. Now that we have done that, let's see. Now what we could do is sum our moments about any point. Take any other point, like point a or point B or point D or point C and sum all forces. Now that we've got this free body diagram, use all the values that we have found, sum our moments and find out if they sum to zero. Sometimes when we're summing moment, we'll get some little residual number like a 0.537 or something for, for huge numbers because if we use any rounding, if you write down answers on your paper and you truncate parts of those numbers, that's going to introduce error, which means it might not perfectly hit zero. If you carry all your digits in your calculator in your calculation, or if those numbers are, are, uh, are precise numbers that have no lost digits, then you will perfectly match if you do it correctly. Okay? All right. 
Let's see, the cable provides a fourth constraint, making it statically indeterminate. This problem gave us the value of the cable tension, which could have been determined other ways as well, and so on. Think about that. All right, here's a new problem, a tractor with gravel. And we can see, now with this kind of problem, we've got to think, as we th uh, look at this, we've got to say, ah, what am I really seeing here? We're going to have to be able to notice a few things. We see that we've got this force here. Okay, great. That one was pretty obvious, and we see the location. Once, if we know what the weight of the tractor is, and we do, we know that that weight is going to go right here, acting down toward the ground. And then if you look at this, these don't look like our normal constraints. We've got all this other stuff that looks like a lot of information. What do we do with that? But all that really matters is this is all a big rigid body, except that we have a roller support here. We can call that A, Y, and a roller support here, B, Y. Now, while this thing is not completely constrained because it can move in the X direction, we can use this sum of forces and moments to solve for these two reactions. We will first want to sum our moments about one of the tires and then about the other. Let's erase the ink on the slide. If we drew a free body diagram, we might have choices like this. Why don't you stop the video and make a decision and then come back. Back yet? Let's look at the answer. Now, if we look at this, we see, okay, this looks like a good choice. We have drawn all forces. We've shown our two reactions is upward. We can see because this, now we don't actually know where these reactions are upward, except that neither of these tires can pull on the on the tractor, they can only push, the ground can only push on them, which means the line of action has to be up. And so this is the most correct of these because this is this 900 pounds in the proper direction, the 2100 pounds is in the proper direction, and our two reactions are noting that the ground can only push back upwards and not downwards. Okay? This B assumes that those forces are going down. Now, you could actually use this to solve the problem, and you will find out that one of your reactions is negative. Well, both of them are negative. This one, this third one, also assumes one is pulling, and the fourth one assumes one is pulling, and that's why those are less, uh, are inferior choices. Okay? Now, once we want to solve this, what we do is we sum our moments about some point. Usually we would solve some of our moments about either point A or point B. Why? Because when we do that, the force acting at that point, since it goes right through the line of action, goes right through that point, it will create no moment, which reduces the algebra we're going to have to do to solve this. If we had summed our moments about point G, it would have worked, but we would have got two forces coming out, unknowns, and then we would have had to sum moment uh, forces to get a second equation, we would then have to combine our equation to solve the problem. If you sum your moments about point A, though, you will immediately get the force at B out of that calculation. If you had instead summed your moments about point B, you would have immediately gotten the force at point A out of the calculation. But if you sum your moments about the 900-pound the, uh, point or the G point, you would have had to do more work that's not clear, write down the equation, summing the moments about each of those points, and make sure you understand what I'm talking about. If we chose point B, now you can choose your equation, stop the video, calculate your own, and then come back. Back yet? There we go. And now we can sum our vertical forces. Okay. Now, if we had a different kind of problem, if we had the same problem, we're given the weight of the tractor, we want to know how much weight before this tips over. Well, remember, these two forces at the wheels can only give you up forces. They can't pull on the thing. So as you add, let's say we have no weight in that 
in that scoop. Both of these forces are going to be up. If you put weight in the scoop, that's going to tend to tip. You've got these two reactions, and as you put weight in the scoop, it's going to tip your tractor like this, which means you've got two reactions at A and B. As you add weight in the scoop over here, it's going to increase the reaction at B and decrease it at A. But it's still going to be upwards for both. The more weight you put in the scoop, the more you decrease the reaction at A until eventually the reaction at A is zero. And after that point, this thing is just going to tip right over because the, the wheel can't hold it down. Now, if we had that wheel strapped to the ground, we could put more weight in the scoop, but we don't. Therefore, that max weight will be the point where summing our moments about point B is zero. So if you sum your moments about B, set them equal to zero, you can calculate how much weight could be in that scoop. Here's your free body diagram, and that's how you would do it. This is just showing us this particular structure up here is indeterminate. Why? Because we've got two forces here, two forces here, two forces here. This has two reactions. This has two reactions. This is not a roller, it's a pin. Both of these have two reactions. We can get the vertical reactions, but we can't get these horizontal reactions. And the reason is because they're in the same line of action we can't figure out whether one of them, whether they take equal force or different forces. So in order to solve indeterminate problems, sometimes we can't solve them at all with statics, and sometimes we need to make a clever assumption in order to solve this. Sometimes chopping this up and analyzing it piece by piece will allow us to solve it. So this one is called indeterminate. This one here, both of these are on rollers. We only have two vertical reactions. That means there's nothing to react the summation of force in the x. That means this is going to accelerate, which brings us to dynamic class, and we're not there yet. This is only partially constrained. This last one, again, has three constraints. That, But this one, all those transfers vertical forces. Now, because we have too many vertical forces, we're not even able to calculate what these vertical reactions are using statics alone. And it also is going to accelerate in the horizontal direction. So this is improperly constrained. So that's just giving us some terminology. That is all we have for this particular lecture. Go back and review this material if you want uh, more practice with these kinds of problems, then I recommend getting a copy of Baron Johnson's book, which actually is really good. It does have a number of tricky problems in it. Or you can get Hibbler's book, which is more down to earth, a little less tricky. Or Miriam and Courage's book. All these are great references for statics, mechanics, vector mechanics for engineers. Quote of statics. That's what you want. Enjoy.